First, let's discuss the plane, then the bomb, and then I'll tell you how an American strategic bomber accidentally dropped an atomic bomb on South Carolina. Now a huge thanks to the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum in Ashland, Nebraska, and Museum Volunteer Ellen for giving me access to a real B-47 so that I can try to bring this terrifying story to life. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and now cars on my second channel. This includes guided tours around interesting aircraft in museums and onboard flights around the world. If you're into these types of videos then please check out my channel and subscribe. The Boeing B-47 Stratojet was a revolutionary aircraft for its time, as it was the first American strategic bomber to feature swept wings and the first to exclusively use turbojet engines. Now it's a bit of a tangent but fascinating nonetheless, because these early turbojets took up to 20 seconds to go from idle to full throttle, when they would descend to land, they would actually have to maintain the throttles at medium power in case they would have to do a go around. But then the extra throttle would stop them from actually slowing down and landing, so they would have to open a drogue parachute and also drop the rear landing and outrigger wheels just to generate enough drag to slow them down. Then closer to landing, they would drop the forward gear and use a larger braking parachute on the ground. It really was a fascinating time in aviation. 2,000 of these B-47s were built, replacing the B-36 as a strategic bomber before going on to other roles before retirement in 1977. To bring this story to life, let's look up through the crew entrance, and immediately on your right was the crawlway through to the weapons bay, which will play an important part of this story. You can see how incredibly narrow it is in here, and you'd have to wonder how anyone could have squeezed their way through. As you're about to see, I was struggling moving around and this was meant to be the wider section which the crew could use to escape during an emergency. Moving up and straight ahead, you're looking at the pilot's seat, but we're going to turn left and move onto the navigator bombardier's position right in the front of the nose after a quick look at the in-flight loo. It was this guy, the nav bombardier, Air Force Captain Bruce Kulka who was given the job of crawling back to the bomb that I'll mention shortly. In another video I take you on a full guided tour of this aircraft, but this one is more about the bomb drop. As you can see it's incredibly tight in here, and I've deleted out all of my moaning as I hit my head and knee on bits of metal, so that you can only imagine how difficult it would have been navigating around in a full flight suit. Turning back and looking at where I've just crawled through, and you get a brief glimpse of the hatch that I've just come up, and on my left now was the pilot's seat. Now if we jump to the Marchfield Aviation Museum in California, and this is a cutaway of the B-47, and you can see another view of where I just was, with the nav bombardier's position down there, and this here is the tunnel that I just crawled along. This here is the pilot seat that I briefly mentioned, and behind him, and making up the third of the three crew members, was the co-pilot's position, where the controls were duplicated, and where the controls were to release the safety pin from the emergency bomb release. But what's especially interesting about this guy's job is that the whole seat could rotate 180 degrees, so that he was now facing rearwards, and looking to the remote control targeting site for the rear 20mm cannon. The idea was that this would be faster and at a higher altitude than any intercepting planes, so they'd only really need to defend themselves from behind and it was much easier to position a crew member here than in a separate pressurized section in the tail. Looking at this step down here, and again here it is from the inside, you'll see the text crew member station, because the nav bombardier would actually be strapped in here during landing and takeoff, so that they could quickly evacuate rather than being stuck in the nose. We'll come back inside shortly, but now let's talk about the bomb. This here on display is a Mark 36, which was not the type used in the Mars Bluff incident. That one was a Mark 6 atomic bomb, weighing roughly 7,600 pounds, and these were carried internally by the B-29, 36, 47, 50, and the B-52 bombers. It was based on the Mark III Fat Man that was detonated over the Japanese city of Nagasaki on the 9th of August, 1945. If fully assembled, this Mark VI would have a yield of around 30 kilotons, which was just under double the power of the Nagasaki bomb, although thankfully this did not have the nuclear core installed. The core was carried on board this aircraft, and in the case of an actual launch command, it would have been installed in flight. 
The bomb still contains two tons of high explosives, which did detonate on the ground, leaving a 70 feet wide and 35 feet deep crater, which I'll show you shortly. Now the B-47 was a difficult aircraft to fly, and many of the systems were rushed into production due to the urgency of the Soviet threat. This meant that things going wrong were expected, so many redundancies were built into everything. This included a bomb quick release handle to jettison the bomb if the other systems failed, or if there was an urgent problem during landing and takeoff, and they would need to get rid of it. Now again, that's not as bad as it sounds, as they could always drop the bomb without an atomic detonation, as long as it had not been activated. During level flight, a locking pin was inserted to prevent a weapon's release if there was a failure of the electrical lock and the weapons had been accidentally released. But that pin was removed during takeoff and landing to allow for a quick emergency release as I just mentioned. On the 11th of March 1958, they took off as planned, but when the co-pilot went to engage the safety pin via a control in his cockpit, the system failed and the pin would not re-engage so the pin would need to be manually engaged, by hand, by some poor sod who would have to climb around. That job went to the navigator bombardier, Captain Bruce Kulka, who would have been strapped into his position in the walkway. As I am now, he'd have to move back down these stairs with the oxygen bottle attached, as he would otherwise quickly become hypoxic as the weapons bay was not pressurised. As you can see, the crawlway was incredibly narrow, so he would have to remove his parachute for the perilous journey, although he wasn't aware that it was about to become 1,000 times more dangerous. Crawling forward, and you can make out the atomic bomb casing directly ahead. And if you've seen my full B-47 tour video, you'll recall the RB-47H electronic intelligence versions, where an additional three crew members would sit inside a pressurized compartment within the bomb bay and operate the equipment detecting Soviet radars from there. But during takeoff and landing, those guys would crawl through this position here and into the main cockpit so that they could escape easily during an emergency during the landing or takeoff. Reaching out forward is a fold-out platform which the crew members could use to get closer to the bomb. And above is a bright red emergency bomb release handle, and rather ominously, it says no hand hold. Here we are looking again from a little lower, and you can see this fold-out platform that could support someone walking. Here's a space through the tunnel again, and this device here was the oxygen system which he could have attached himself to. Museum volunteer Alan is squatting on the platform, and this is where Captain Bruce would have been as he attempted to insert the pin. As you can see where Alan is holding, there weren't any specific grab handles, so it was a matter of grabbing whatever you could. So Captain Bruce would have been down here doing something that he never trained to do, in very low light, while moving around with turbulence, which we often know is worse at lower altitudes. The story goes that they hit some especially rough turbulence and he grabbed at the nearest handle, but that ended up being the red emergency release. To his horror, the bomb dropped, smashing its way through the bomb bay doors, and while he knew that it wasn't armed, so there was not a risk of an atomic detonation, he was now squatting on that ledge without a parachute at 15,000 feet just above the broken and open doors. It would have been pretty terrifying as the bomb bay filled with the turbulent cold wind. He then had to crawl back and break the bad news to the pilots who, to be honest, would have noticed something anyway as the bombs were so heavy that the aircraft were known to dramatically rise following their release due to the sudden reduction in weight. The sudden upward movement of the aircraft would have also made Captain Bruce's position even more unstable, really highlighting how terrifying the whole event would have been for him. Apparently the pilot did hear a bang and the co-pilot was reported to have noticed a shockwave from the detonation. As I said earlier, it still contained two tons of high explosives, but thankfully it landed in an open space near the community of Mars Bluff and no one was killed, although several nearby houses and a church were damaged. Railroad conductor Walter Gregg and his wife Effie and four children were at home when the bomb detonated around 50 yards from his garage. The military quickly arrived and kept interested spectators and journalists away, and nuclear scientists ensured that there was no significant radiation leak. The family sued the Air Force, receiving $54,000 in compensation and apology letters from the crew. There was a lot of media attention at the time, although the government was able to massage the emphasis away from the fact that they accidentally dropped a nuke on American soil towards more of a safety message of, hey, well, at least there wasn't a nuclear detonation. Here's footage of the actual crater just a few years ago next to the memorial for the incident. 
As you can see, it's been partially filled in just through decades of weather and the movement of soil, but you can still make it out. Since 1950, there have been 32 known broken arrow incidents, and that name is applied to an unexpected event involving nuclear weapons that result in the accidental launching, firing, detonating, theft, or loss of a weapon. Usually they're recovered, but up to now, six nuclear weapons remain lost and never recovered. And this is just what we know about the United States. So you can only begin to worry how many nuclear weapons the Soviets and the Russians have lost over the last few decades. While we're fortunate that no one died in this incident, what really worries me about these types of events is the hypothetical scenario of what might have happened if the bomb was dropped over a populated area. I suppose it's possible that that might have then initiated a retaliatory action against the Soviets, even though it was never the Soviets in the first place. It's all a bit scary. Thanks again to Alan and the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum for letting me film this aircraft and please check out my channel for a whole lot more videos I've filmed here including detailed tours around this B-47, the B-36, F-111, SR-71, B-58 Hustler and more. Thanks for watching.